well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Today we have a double feature in line with uh, with really one of the greats in the Hall of Fame. I think so. Something like Tank Girl and Schindler's List, I think. Something like that. We're bordering on that territory. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the names responsible for that double feature are myself, right. Eric Ingram, and uh, Michael Armagoddam motherfucking Kester. Wow. Yeah. So, um, we have some explaining to do, maybe a little bit? We do. I think the first step of explaining would be revealing the films. Uh, yes. So, there's two movies. The first uh-huh. one is 12 Angry Men. Okay. And the second one is the, naturally what you First would... thing that comes to mind when you think 12 Angry Men. Uh, Predators, I mm-hmm. think, is probably... No, that's not it at all. <laughs> uh, that is the movie we're doing. Probably the last thing that might come to your mind, but not on this goddamn show. You know, these are two films that uh, have obvious, I mean, stark differences, but uh, probably have a lot more in common than, you know, than you might think. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're hoping here, and uh, I mean, this is this is ultimately my idea, and you can kind of let me know what you think about this. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping, we do this once in a while, we trick people into watching movies by putting one film they really like and then promising them that they would like this other film, even yeah. if that's not true. I think we do that a lot of the time. I know that a lot of the time when we put films in order on the show, we always put the uh, the one everybody's seen first to sure. try to trick people into having to watch the second one. I don't know if that's even the case this time. I think it's no, about, it's not this time. I think it's a kind of a mix. I think some people have seen 12 Angry Men. Some people have seen Predators. But we have a very, very high number of people who have not seen both of those movies. And uh, we wanted to do 12 Angry Men for quite a bit of time. Mm-hmm. And we tried to pair it with other things. And uh, to be honest with you, I thought all of our potential pairs made too much sense. Yeah. It always seemed like one of those things where we kind of go, is this too obvious? Right. Can we really do 12 Angry Men and something blah, blah, crime something with juries something? Yeah. And it just seems seems too obvious. And yeah, and too little to really cover because we would just say the same thing twice. So we have some chapters if you decide you don't want to see both of the movies. There is kind of a, a heavy theme of, I don't know, some kind of uh, team-centric sure. idea that we're going to delve into a little bit in both of the movies. But if we can't talk you into seeing 12 Angry Men, a great film, you can chapter over to Predators. And had you not seen the other Predator films, mm-hmm. or at least the first one, right. I guess... Or you just don't believe that Predators is a great film. Which it is. You can then chapter to the end of the show. Now, really quick, uh, before we get into the first movie, wh- what's going on with all this Predator stuff? We uh, we covered um, all the Predator films when we did Killapalooza 19. And, it wasn't uh, 19. We're not quite there yet. Okay. Well, oh, man, and we're going to have a Killapalooza next time. That's true. Uh, people are going to be chaptering away right now. But we uh, we covered all the Predator movies. Suffice to say, Predator is an alien that hunts people. We're not going to go into detail. That's really all you need. I think you could see the new Predator movie. And oh, it yeah. Wouldn't Completely even, independent. I don't think it would harm anything in the original one whatsoever. But if you'd rather just cheat, as so many people do, and just listen to our show as if it's some kind of substitute for watching movies, which, believe you me, it is not, then you could go back to the uh, Alien vs. Predator Killapalooza, which did not actually become a slasher franchise until, you know, the last three movies mm-hmm. of those uh, of uh, that whole set. So, 12 Angry Men is a movie that should probably get paired with uh, The Man from Earth and not with Predators. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But goddamn it, it's going with Predators right now. Yeah. This is a movie that explores something that's very interesting to me, which is jury duty. Okay. I thought you were going to say Henry Fonda. Which is Henry Fonda. That's mine. Conducting jury duty. Perfect. Uh, Yes. You've never been on a jury, right? I have not. You've never voted, have you? Uh, that's not true. I have voted. You have voted. I don't know if voting in juries, if that is actually I think, how you I get think selected. I think when you sign up for selective service is when... Selective service? Yeah, when you turn 18, you have to sign up for something about being in the Oh, army. yeah, right. That, too. We have no idea how you get on a jury. If you have facts about have that... Have you served on a jury? I haven't. Okay. No. Uh, to make sure that was covered. Double feature show at gmail.com. We want facts. Not you heard one time that if you vote, you'll get picked for a jury. But uh, a lot of people, especially in the United States, 
they fear jury duty. They hate jury duty. That's kind of the old joke, you know, how do you get out of jury duty? I guess the joke would be literally any sentence that follows that. Right. And you can say just about anything to get out of jury Mm -hmm. duty. Uh, Many of the things we uh, proclaim all the time, there is no God. Sure. Or perhaps uh, science-based skepticism, Uh requiring facts, being pacifist, not believing in the death penalty. I mean, all of these things. Pretty much double feature stands to reason as to why we probably will never serve on a jury. I host double feature. At least not in the next 10 years. Would be, yeah. I host, uh, also I listen to double feature. I listen to double feature, right. So all things to get you out of a jury. However, I'm not one of those people who, oh my God, what could I say to get out of a jury? I would love to serve on a jury. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Now, granted, it's not really that John Waters jury that uh, I'm sure he fantasizes about. It's probably mostly traffic cases and boring... Yeah, you know, I don't know if the juries don't even see traffic cases, do they? I don't know. I you know really what I'm talking about, though. Mundane I've never stuff. been to court. I've never been in a courtroom. Oh, really? Never. I have been in a courtroom. It's scary and a story for another time. Is that when we get to too fast, too furious? Yeah, no, it was just uh, one cop and an angry judge, and that was it. One angry judge. Can you imagine me in a courtroom? No. Nope. I mean, I don't even look like... I would never get a fucking chance. Oddly enough, you never see these characters in a courtroom either. <laughs> no, you don't. Thank you for transitioning back on topic. I You're appreciate welcome. that. You're welcome. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Uh, I mean, you see it in the beginning. They file out of a courtroom. Yeah, they all kind of give the suspect one last glance. They give us a glance sure. at the uh, the suspect, the accused. Defendant. The defendant, thank right. you. And so we're we're looking completely at their debates over whether right. or not this man is guilty. We get no trial, and that helps uh, keep us glued to the screen. You know what I mean? It's it's not a matter of we want to go in knowing as much as these guys because we don't. We didn't hear right. the trial. Instead, we're learning about the trial from them. I think this is purely a suspense technique or at least a containment kind of technique to right. say here's the story we're telling. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's definitely the latter. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about the drama between these 12 men, and that's where it's going to be. It's going to be in that room. So conceptually, it's there too. But my immediate go-to when you're doing something like this is to say, oh, so we would be in the position of these characters and we would get all of the information they have or something like that. But that's the complete opposite of what we're doing here. That's a, a totally different tactic. Instead, we're going into a room where the only information that matters is... With the exception of this character who brings in the knife, uh, that's Juror 8, right? Right. Played by Henry Fonda. Right. So with the exception of him and uh, and that bit there, there is no new information really introduced in this room. Right. In fact, when you when that scene comes up, it almost, at least to me, it feels a little strange. Yeah, well, and it does. But the other, it first off, something about that scene that took me aback mm-hmm. is that I didn't know you were allowed to like, walk around the defendant's neighborhood <laughs> sure, and sure. gather your own evidence. Right. I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> right. um, not, not okay. something you can do. Also bringing a, a switchblade into a courtroom. Right. Well, is... apparently even buying switchblades were illegal Yeah, at that point. I believe still illegal. Uh, uh, d- I think it depends on where you live. Sure, sure. Well, um, Chicago, I just assume yeah. everything is illegal. Three now. inches or spring-loaded are the two no-nos. So he brings that in, but also it really doesn't influence anybody's opinion in the in the room right except for maybe the audience yeah that's not the point where people start bailing on right the uh, guilty verdict right it's just it's a moment where juror eight gets to go look maybe something's possible that we didn't initially think was even sure a possibility yeah that uh causes you to be a lot more humble about your position right i think that's really what that's well it opens do. your mind to the possibility that because honestly if I were to be in a room, think of it outside of a film standpoint, right? Mm-hmm. You're in a room with 12 men who have just sat through court proceedings. Right. And 11 of them vote guilty. My initial reaction is he's probably guilty. Yeah, exactly. You're going to side with, uh, because they have all the information, right, right? Exactly. They have all the facts. We have no facts. They sit down and take a preliminary vote and they all say guilty. Right. And I have some kind of inkling to believe the man who says not guilty. And I mean, not just because I'm aware that the film is going to take mm-hmm. me on an adventure. There's going to be an arc here, and I'm looking for the arc. But because you're a humanist and you like to believe that nobody does anything wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. You know what I'm talking yep. about, right? <laughs> Every time I hear somebody's guilty of something, I'm just like, that didn't happen. Yep. I that fully, person didn't I do that. I fully agree with you. Another thing. Raise your hand. Humanist. Totally bad juror. Yep. Get out of here. 
I mean, uh, I just don't. Basically, because we would want to walk in there thinking, well, we're going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Well, we've seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Right. Remember talking about that? I mean, having a bunch of papers you're waving around saying, uh, I confess, does not necessarily make you a serial killer. Mm -hmm. That's not a spoiler, by the way. I know everybody just freaked out. (laughs) Totally, if you haven't seen that movie, not a spoiler in the least. If you have seen that movie, still not a spoiler. Completely new information. I'm amazed when you're introduced to these jurors, uh, how fast you can both love and hate the characters. Yeah, well, I think, uh, who's that, juror number three? Yeah, number three. The That's one exactly that you, who I was thinking. You fell of. in love with immediately because the first thing out of his mouth is, let's talk about the facts. Yeah, I'm only paying facts. attention to the facts. Right. But then he immediately becomes a total asshole. He starts going off about kids these days. Yeah, exactly. Which is really the number one way to look like an asshat. <laughs> Just man, when I was young, every, you know, everybody called their dad sir like fuck you, buddy. What yep. what the fuck is this guy's problem? And so now, you know, nowadays all humanity has crumbled. Uh everything is worthy of the cynicism you're giving it. People are all shit and the future of America is, you know, here's the reality of the situation. The future of America created by today's youth, will be so much fucking better than the future that you and I have created. That's true. Because our future here, our present, hard what we're living in... Hard drives will be in, smaller. I thank you. Hard drives will be smaller. Hard drives will probably be non-existent. Yep. Websites still hosted in the cloud. But our, uh, our present here is better than that of the generation before us. That's true. And the generation before that. Absolutely. I am a firm believer that the world is consistently... Progressing. Uh, progressing. It's getting constantly sure. better over time. Perfect example... Sidney Lament makes this film, right? This sure. film comes out. Great film. Sidney Lament, we'll talk about him as a, a director another time. Too much stuff to talk right. about here. But when this film came out, you could not uh, do the sort of thing the show might do in, I don't know, creating a Google search like 12 Angry Men Naked or 12 Angry Men. What is it? 12 Angry Men with Hot Chicks. 12 Angry Men with Hot Chicks. 12 Angry Men Bikinis. You could not Google that and perhaps find a short that someone had made recreating scenes from 12 Angry Men using just women in bikinis. Uh-huh. That did not exist 50 no, years ago. it didn't. Exists now. World constantly better. Case closed. Proved. Done. Anyways. So we've already got out of the way the belligerently angry guy who's got some personal vendetta against kids these days. Fuck that guy. And Peter Fonda's playing Davis, who is juror number eight, who is the dissenter. But we're already still in a room with 10 other dudes. Yeah. So what the film does is it proceeds to give them all basic kind of character stereo outlines the leader guy Uh uh-huh little weasley man yeah man with glasses you mean man with hamster sweat right hamster sweat Uh, then we have uh grew up in hard times Mm -hmm. blue collar worker yeah just wants to see baseball oh god then we're around to peter fonda Uh uh-huh old man with a heart you're doing great at this i am so you're gonna get through all 12 bigoted racist or just hater of Low-income people. Okay, can we pause for just a second on yes. that? So we're having a little bit of a dispute here. Right. We can't tell if he's racist or if he just doesn't like people who grew up in the slums. Probably supposed to mean maybe both. Okay, totally fine. Moving on. European watchmaker. All right, great. Salesman who flip-flops. Yeah. That the, is our uh, 12 men. Those are the 12. They are here to solve a puzzle. Their past uh, only important when it informs our case, informs their decision on our case. And so then the movie becomes about creating tension in this single room. And that can be, you know, uh, that can go either way. It Mm -hmm. can be a difficult thing to do, trying to keep people entertained while not moving, changing your set uh, at all. When we were talking about um, Sideways, just back on the other episode, we noticed while we were watching the film how they would move from scene to scene to scene for seemingly no reason. Right. Especially when they're in her house. <laughs> right. They're just, just like, let's go in this room. Right. Now we'll go in this room. Mm-hmm. Now we'll go in this room. More so conversations no one, no over one wine. bored about wine. But here we're stuck in one room. So this will either naturally make the audience feel claustrophobic if you're, you know, if you're doing a couple sure. key things right, or it'll just bore the shit out of everybody and they'll feel the need to leave. Right. Thankfully, it does the first one. Right. I mean, I would hope for everybody. Yeah, that's well, I think, I think what happens is it does the first one to the audience and the second one to the men in the room. Sure, right. Well, so you have the heat that starts amping up in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, the rain. I mean, I don't know if you noticed the sound on the rain. Yep. And there's at least two points where I notice it almost drowns out uh, what people are saying. The rain right. is so loud, I can, I can barely concentrate on what's going on. And then the camera work, I mean, the camera moving in for these 
uh, extreme close-ups. Yeah. You know, occasionally it will cut to somebody in that close-up, uh-huh. but more frequently, and I found this specifically in the beginning, the camera will move in on that person. Yeah. It will uh, kind of back them in a corner a little bit, right. at, at least visually. And by the time you get to the end, you're getting extreme close-ups from one person to another. It's just, uh, you know, they're shot from kind of right above the eyebrows down to a little bit below their collar. Mm-hmm. And you get in that close and you go from one person to another back and forth. It's, sure. uh, it's sort of an unusual way to shoot a scene. You don't usually get so many back and forth extreme close-ups yeah. for such a prolonged period of time. It really makes you feel closed in. Yeah, and it, it looks strange. It took me a while to get used to it. I think particularly because some of the actors are really weird not seeing their hand motions and sure, the rest right. of their range of motion, right. particularly juror number nine. I'm just going to come out and say that. Yeah. Well, they, um, uh, you know, they use everybody's faces right. to, to tell the story. But I think, yeah, at the same time, you need these people's close-ups because you need to see, for example, juror number four, you need to see his mind change right. when they talk about wearing glasses to bed. Sure. You need to see the discomfort in juror 12's eyes when he goes back to guilty and then right. back to not guilty sure. because he really just doesn't know. But at least he's going on doesn't know, right. not definitely innocent. Right, right. Yeah, they also look weird because they light them a little right. strangely. Uh, it's it's light directly on their faces rather than just kind of coming from a source and lighting you know different people in different ways. I think the movie is just trying to get you to focus on those faces so much. So if the extreme close-up is literally, let's say it's like uh, their their mid forehead to their chin, somewhere around there, or below their collar, mm-hmm. the light will literally be from right above their eyebrows to right, you know, right. before their their sure. chin kind of ends. It's just on their face. It's specifically a single light pointed at right. a person's face. Well, it's the same lighting scheme that Mel Brooks used when we watched Young Frankenstein. Oh, I don't even remember that. To make it look like it was an old sure. '30s film. Right. Right. And this whole dilemma takes place in one room. They go to the bathroom. Right. Okay. So we have to, we can't say one room because we'll get an angry email. Sure. Right. And it's just the shots get tighter and people get sweatier. The man who doesn't sweat begins to sweat. Right. But yeah. by the time juror number three breaks down and sobs before the camera cuts away from him, mm-hmm. they have knocked on the door. They've delivered the verdict of not guilty. And they get to walk out into the, what I assume is a very cool, rainy afternoon. Yeah, it certainly seems like it. You definitely get that feeling coming out of there. Breathing. Because, yeah, I mean, it's the, the first time you get an expansive shot. Right. It's the first time you're not zoomed in on someone's face. It's the first time you see the 12 men and you can't figure out which one is which. <laughs> right. So, you know, you're, you're in this wide shot. There's room to breathe. And I think rarely has a film accomplished this so well. You just get this sense of freedom that is, I mean, it's honestly really unbelievable. So this is one of those movies a lot of people might watch in high school just Mm -hmm. to learn more about the legal system or, you know, how that branch of the government operates. Apparently a lot of people have. I'm not one of those people. They point out a lot of the shortcomings of the legal system and a lot of the the things that honestly would be important if you were to ever serve on a jury. Something like, the task of a court appointed lawyer. Yeah, absolutely. And whether or not they're going to do a good job just because they resent being there or because they're not interested in the case. Well, yeah, that's a, a great point they bring up is what if the lawyer is just bad? Yeah. And that's what the jury is there for. You know, the lawyer is a kind of facilitator of the facts. Right. They're going to bring out these pieces of information they think is important for the jury. The jury needs to then comb through that information Rather than just going, well, this is the story I was told, do I believe it or not, is the man guilty? Instead, they can carefully maneuver through the different facts they've been presented and try and piece together a story for themselves. In that way, I guess they are doing a little bit of that, what we think of as detective work. It's post-detective work. Yeah, right. It's kind of an assembly of facts that have already been brought out. And then you have to reassemble them to make sure that they actually fit together. It's the end of the uh, Scooby-Doo mystery where somehow we've stumbled upon a bunch of clues we weren't really looking for. And now we know who did it and whether or not they did it. So it's utilizing that skill set. Another thing they talk about that I really, really love is uh, right in the beginning, the severity of the crime being more powerful than the quality of evidence or even the likelihood of guilt. You know, they talk about uh, how this kid is, you know, is a murderer. 
mm-hmm. and how bad that makes him and how they shouldn't even give him, you know, a fair evaluation of, right. you know, of his case. Basically bring him in and dump him into the electric chair. Yeah, right. Don't even give him the favor of taking a preliminary vote. What does it matter? We know he's guilty. Let's all just say he's guilty and, and go home. And so often, you know, especially when you're dealing with things uh, like rape, cases of rape or child molestation, I mean, if you're accused of child molestation uh, in modern times, you might as well have been accused of being a witch, Mm -hmm. right? Or being a communist. Well, yeah, I would say definitely more like being a communist because people who were accused of being a witch were 100% innocent 100% of the time. Okay, sure, sure. Whereas child molesters probably... Not 100% innocent 100% of the time. I completely agree with you. Yeah, as long as it's some percentage, Mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter. What I'm getting at is is simply that uh, as soon as that claim is raised, everybody thinks your life is ruined. Uh, Back when we we did look, except for the fact that that was a different case. (laughs) Sure, right, right. I think the most despicable thing, though, is easily how impatient uh, Juror 7 is, especially. I mean, everybody's a little impatient. Uh Uh-huh. But that fucking seventh juror, yeah. he just does not stop. He, um, you know, you mentioned him. He has, a, what, a ball game he has to he's get to? He's got a ball game. He's got, he's got a pair of baseball tickets burning a hole in his pocket. He has places to be. He doesn't want his time to be wasted. You and I have complained on the show before about being busy people. Yes. We have other projects. We're trying to do things. Still trying to fucking figure out Final Cut 10. No time. Very frustrating. However... Get your goddamn priorities in line. <laughs> Man's life hanging in the balance, resting in your hands, uh, the ball game. Now, yeah. look, I realized TV wasn't really prevalent back when this film was made. Right. And people couldn't just go home and turn on the tube and watch the game. And they didn't all have TiVos, right? Right. However, uh, seriously, a fucking dude's life. I feel like these are the people that should be weeded out sure. of jury right. selection. Well, especially with baseball, where when it comes down to it, you can look at a sheet of paper at the score, and it doesn't matter what actually happened within yeah. the game. Sure. Um, sure. And we have this guy who I could, I call it from the beginning, mm-hmm. right? I see him walk in. I see he's eager to get out. And in my head, I go, as soon as not guilty has the majority he's going to switch. So that's a concern uh, with a jury, how long that deliberation is going to take, jury fatigue right. is uh, obviously another big thing. A but, hung jury. Yeah, exactly that. But they also talk about, I think it's juror 11, that kind of raises the idea of beyond a reasonable doubt, mm-hmm. which uh, juror 8 reiterates later. Yeah. When I was first learning about the American legal system, that was the biggest kind of shock to me, Yeah, is learning that, all right, you're going to convict somebody of murder. You have to have an entire jury agree beyond a reasonable doubt sure. that this man is guilty of murder. Sure. It's the back end to innocent until proven guilty. Exactly. Exactly. Unless everybody decides this man is guilty, they have no reason to doubt that beyond a reasonable reason, then he can't be found guilty. Right. So one dissenting man can really, I mean, that's the, that's the huge takeaway from this movie. It's the entire plot of this movie. Yeah. It's the uh, really the premise of sure. the movie. Twelve Angry Men happens really because of that consensus. But the the thing that sort of um, brings the the movie's arc all the way to the end is beyond a reasonable doubt. They are creating things that go beyond reasonable doubts. Sure, they're basically asking the question: not do you think he's guilty or do you think he's innocent, but is there a possibility that, that he didn't do it? That he didn't do it, right? And if there is a possibility he didn't do it, not let's prove he didn't do it. But if there is a possibility he didn't do it... He's not guilty. Then you have to vote not guilty. You just have to. That's how the system has been set up. As they're breaking down these different reasons, um, the older man, I think he's juror nine, he talks about uh, a person's need to contribute. Uh And, you know, we've mentioned on the show before the uh, how unreliable eyewitness testimony is. Also, I think you do see this from time to time, how somebody just wants to be a part of something. Mm Mm-hmm. They want to have some evidence for you. I mean, you probably see that uh, fairly commonly, you know, when investigating cases like this. People just want to be in on the excitement. Yeah, well, I mean, it's and I, it, it's painted in a it's it's painted in almost a negative picture here. Mm-hmm. But I like to think of it as people just want to help. Sure. Certainly. Unfortunately, they're hurting by lying. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the best way to help is to just not have seen anything. Yeah, I mean, they need to feel necessary, but it's it's also just they want to help out. Something yeah. bad happened, and they want to help. 
And sometimes that can, you know, go to the point of them making themselves believe something. Right. They go over something, you know, over and over in their mind saying, did I hear this? Could it have been this? It was definitely this. Okay, now I know it's this. And they become convinced of it. And then they go deliver that, you know, to whoever's investigating this. We see this in skepticism all the time, right? People who uh, come forward with some kind of evidence for something or something to, uh, you know, they basically want to contribute. So they find themselves believing things that uh, don't have any, you know, factual kind of uh, footing. I'm I'm thinking really specifically about uh, conspiracy cases. But I, I suppose that goes to, you know, really every, every piece in the realm of skepticism. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about something like loose change. I don't think anybody in loose change really has, you know, a, a cynical sort of, they're not trying to like make money off their DVDs or anything. Uh, maybe that's happening. But I feel like it's more, they think they know the truth. Right. They've started down this conspiracy kind of path. They feel a responsibility to at least voice whatever it is they think Absolutely. is the case. Absolutely. Subscribing to conspiracy theories, another thing that should throw you off of a jury case. That's probably true. Predators, I suppose, then, would be a movie that you would pair with Cube. But we kind of ruined that as well. We met, we already used Man from Earth and Cube in, uh, I believe, same year? No, two different years. So you're falling from the sky, you get uh, your main character crashing into the ground, and then... That's where you show your title card. Fucking Predators. Predators, plural. Awesome. It's those goddamn Rodriguez openings, yeah. right? Or is it a Rodriguez so opening? So there's... It's not a... I don't want to say a rift because it sounds like we're arguing, and we're certainly not arguing... But we have two differing schools of thought on Predators. I think we may both believe the two different schools of thought. I think that's... And the thing is, is that Robert Rodriguez produced Predators. Right. We know he wrote Predators back in, like, 1994. Sure. I think that's the exact year he wrote it. It was right around Desperado. Right. But it's directed by Nimrod Antal, and I'm inclined to give... The director, full credit, because that's kind of just how I operate. That's what I would do if somebody else were to have produced and written a Rodriguez movie. Sure. I would say Robert Rodriguez made that film. Right. um, From Dust Till Dawn. Perfect example. Sure. And there is no evidence to the contrary. So there is no reasonable doubt here. Sure. (laughs) Okay. But neither of us are sure what kind of a hand Robert Rodriguez played in producing this film. Honestly, I've never even seen the director. That could be a pseudonym. Yeah, right. Right, it certainly could. I've seen a couple interviews with him. I'm pretty sure he's a real guy. Okay. Although you know Rodriguez and his CG <laughs> magic. Um, here's, okay, so I don't want to get conspiratorial uh, right. on this movie. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably agree with you. Director directed the movie. That's totally fine. But here's the thing. Robert Rodriguez fucking wrote this movie. Yeah. We've all known that for, I mean, it's been 15 years. Yeah. Uh, Everybody's aware that there was a Predator script floating around that Rodriguez wrote at some point. Now, he doesn't get credit for this in the movie's official credits. Right. He doesn't even have a written by Rodriguez. Original story by. Yeah. Right. Well, that's because they have to give the original story to the people who actually made Predator. Right. So he's spoken openly in the public that he wrote this. There's two other people credited for writing it, and I'm sure they did a lot of work on it. Mm -hmm. I do not mean to discredit them. Well, you have to keep in mind that the difference between 1994 and 2010, there's a lot that you would need to change just in the kinds of things that just won't work anymore. Sure. And the fact that instead of having a guy that looks like Danny Trejo, you can just hire Danny Trejo. Yeah, that's uh, viable now. You also have to add that double A twelve in your right in your something script. that didn't exist in nineteen ninety four. Yeah, these I think everybody's seen this video, right? Yeah, I've seen it. So there's uh, so that's everyone. There's um in this room, it certainly is. The A twelve is this automatic shotgun, which I mean, the video's been around for three or four years. Uh-huh. It's on YouTube. You can uh, you can take a look at it. But it's, I mean, it's an automatic shotgun. Right. That's all that needs to be said about it. It almost looks like a Tommy gun, though. It has that sure. um, that the drum dr- on the bottom of yeah. it. Yeah, so it'll shoot, you know, an eight shell magazine or whatever. But you can get this 30-something round drum that goes in the bottom, and it automatically fires. It's, uh, it's a pretty insanely terrifying weapon. Yeah. That and the fact that, I mean, so it'll do buckshot. Right. But That's it'll also do spray. the, it'll do the slugs we talked about during Terminator. Uh-huh. The 
the things that are probably not actually slugs, but James Cameron just doesn't know what a, right. a shotgun firing looks like. Right. But in addition to um, uh, flares, and what are the things that police shoot at people to kill them, but they're Bean supposed bags, to be non-lethal? Rubber bullets? Rubber bullets, okay. yeah, those. Uh, it'll also shoot this thing, which I love the name of it. It's called Frag 12. Uh-huh. Now, you've seen the uh, the picture of Frag 12. How yeah. would you describe this? Um. Frag 12, it looks like something developed by Marvel Comics. It's, Maybe something from the Iron Man movies. It yeah. looks like a tiny little nuclear bomb, Yeah, but that could fit in a shotgun. So what does it do? Blows the fuck up. <laughs> it is, it's a tiny <laughs> nuclear bomb. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a grenade, yeah. but it's got these little kind of fins. on the. Yeah. It looks terrifying. It looks fucking terrifying. Anyways, these are all new things. But to get back to Rodriguez for a minute. Uh-huh. So he's credited as producer. He's credited as uh, doing the, the dubbing and sound, re-recording sure. artist or whatever it is. And credited as the uh, visual effects executive producer right. in charge of that stuff. Totally buy all that. It's filmed in Texas, so that's not too far of a stretch. Right. Over half of it filmed in Texas. Take so they that could get that, uh, movie. Yeah, get that amazing tax credit, right? We didn't get a chance to talk about that either. I'm Let's just going to keep you. getting off the subject. That's fine. Because this is all just amazing stuff. Um, I meant to mention it on the year end, and it, I just didn't think about it. There was a, a story in the news, she's oh, probably fucking like seven months ago now or something. Um, I saw it, actually it was on Rachel Maddow's show, which uh, despite disagreeing with about 50% of what she says, I still watch uh, all the time. Really dig that show. And she brought up the story about Robert Rodriguez, which was kind of strange. And this law that was passed in Texas where there were these huge tax breaks for people who filmed in Texas. I suspect that Robert Rodriguez wrote the fucking law himself, because right. when you think shoots in Texas, yeah. you think Robert Rodriguez. Right. And so there was this big press event they held at Troublemaker Studios with the dude who wrote the bill or whatever, and it turns out the first movie that was actually made under that bill to get the tax break was Machete, okay. which... <laughs> features a corrupt Texas politician. Shooting immigrants. Yeah, so I'm not really sure uh, how, how things fared for that bill, but I thought that was funny, one of the first ones being taken advantage of. And I imagine that Predators was the same way. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So there was all this stuff that came out as they were producing this, which, to be honest, I didn't pay a lot of attention to because when Rodriguez movies are supposed to be coming out, I honestly, I'm just blind and deaf to them until there's a trailer. Right. Last I checked, IMDb has Sin City 3 coming out before Sin City 2. Absolutely. Still the case. Yeah, so you can never be too certain with this stuff. I just wait for it to show up in a theater. And it, even in the case of the fucking trailers, yep. I mean, that's not even true because Machete, Machete had a trailer before Machete really did exist. And you told me all the time, oh yeah, Machete's coming out and I didn't fucking believe right. it. Right. I didn't believe me. But as he's doing press and talking about Predators and it's going to be awesome, he said, oh, I want to film it in Texas so I can just hop over to the soundstage at Troublemaker, which is basically his backyard, uh -huh. and just shoot a couple quick fun scenes. I shoot think he said cool he wanted scenes. to yeah, shoot the cool scenes, right? So, of course, he doesn't get the director credit. Right. And there could be all sorts of weird reasons behind yeah. that. But it, it would seems, all be speculation at this point. Yeah, we just don't know. He's a producer, and he's definitely one of those producers that would get really, really involved right. in the work. Also, when you read any interviews or look up any stuff for the... It's all Robert Rodriguez's Predators, right? despite the fact he is just a producer. Right. He talks that thing up in a way that, you know, Quentin Tarantino didn't quite talk up Hellride or right. Hostel. You know sure. what I mean? He appears places to, to really say, you know, this film is great. His name is attached, and he's proud that his yeah, name is attached. But he's not talking about when they made it, this was their intention. Right. Now, I wanted to talk about all this stuff, because I know back when we covered Machete, we just sidelined all this. We uh -huh. said there's some confusion. We don't know what was going on. But uh, I was looking through the archive of all of the, the film information, the cameras they were using, and the, you know, mm -hmm. the production dates and all that stuff. And it looks like that they wrapped the final production on uh, Machete the week that Predators actually started. Okay. So I always assumed these were sort of filmed simultaneously. Yeah, me too. But it looks like they wrapped shooting on Machete and then, you know, four days later or something started shooting huh. on Predators. Kept Danny Trejo busy. Yeah, they really did, didn't they? Uh, Danny Trejo is just the, the busiest fucking guy. Danny yeah. Trejo is really the answer to that question we yeah. were searching for, who has appeared the most on the show. I think, I think. it's pretty close. I think Danny Trejo is the non-slasher uh, oh, yeah. uh, guy. The non-cheat. 
So I don't know if that makes it, you know, easier or more difficult to determine what Rodriguez did. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't heard the commentary. I haven't Uh heard it for this or Machete. Okay. Because they both came out in the era of, you know, digital stuff instead of I went out and bought the DVD stuff. Right. So those are, you know, kind of rainy day, keep in the back pocket when life is awful. Just Mm -hmm. turn on the commentary for I have these two wonderful things that I can enjoy. And then, you know, Dan Zimmerman, who did the, he was the editor on Spy Kids 4, and uh-huh. also, strangely, the editor on um, uh, Alien vs. Predator uh, Requiem. Huh. So that complicates things, too. Wow. So he's definitely in that Rodriguez camp, but that doesn't mean anything, because it was Troublemaker. So I have no idea. Here's what I do want to add to this Predator's conversation. Okay. Everybody in this movie appears to have a specialty. Yeah, we're kind of going back to the previous film on today's show where you're thrust into an environment full of people you don't fucking know. So rather than everyone rolling their eyes at this, right? I kind of feel like we should maybe defend the... I don't know if you okay. feel the same way. I didn't have... I saw this in the theater. We both saw it separate theaters midnight when it came out. Right. You said you had some hang-up where it seemed like everybody was a stereotypical, you know, this guy fills the Yakuza role, this guy right. fills the white trash prisoner role and i totally see that but it didn't bother me i think it's because of uh the fact that you just have to do that yeah i don't know if i would necessarily say it bothered me right it was just that it it was the conversation that i was having with the group of people this was the first showplace icon movie i'd went to Uh and we were floored by that and we talked for a long time and that was one of the things that was kind of brought up that you know it was just quick and easy backstories and that was kind of cheesy and i didn't really know what to say about that yeah but watching it with 12 Angry Men totally brought yep. that into a new light. Sure. Well, you have if you're put in a situation like that, you need to have characters that people can latch on to understanding faster than you kill them off. Well, I don't even know if that's so much writing as it is. That's just what happens when none of the characters right. know each other. Sure. I don't know that these characters are any more cookie cutter than any other characters. Right. It just, I mean, look back to 12 Angry Men and think, all right, here's a movie that no one, no one's basically going to bash the writing of 12 Angry Men anywhere in the, the community of filmmaking sure. or film watching. Right. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find somebody to say, oh, 12 Angry Men, all those characters are so cookie cutter. However, you have the old guy and you have the sports guy and you, we, we went through yeah. all the goddamn characters. Right. You can say this guy and that guy. When the characters don't really know each other and they're thrown into a situation like predators, Mm -hmm. they talk about two things. They talk about their situation and how to get out of it. And they give small details about their background. As it applies to the situation. There you go. So this is just something that, you know, normally you see it a bit in films because you don't know the characters, but here you see it tenfold because the characters don't know each other either. Right. Well, and none of them are the type of people. They're all, you know, various forms of predators, right? Right. They're all these killers, these fighters, these soldiers, None of them are going to hang out with another killer fighter soldier and talk about back home, man, I got all the, except for maybe the fucking criminal yeah. because he's, that's all he ever does is yeah. sits around and talks about his life before he went to jail and sure. how his sister has big tits. Yeah. It goes as far as, you know, us actually projecting ideas onto the characters that aren't even necessarily there. Look at um, hamster plant guy, right? Uh, Topher Grace's character. Can't get away from these hamster styles, by the way. Just, it's becoming a natural association to film. So you get the impression Topher Grace is the team medic. He's the medic. You look at that guy, he must be the medic. He doesn't have a gun. He's the medic. You've been playing too much Team Fortress. Yep. I don't know what it is. He's the... Explain to me, all right, what indicates that he's the medic? You first see the guy, you look at him, you go, all right, that guy guy must be the doctor in the group. Well, I think um, glasses. He's wearing glasses. Okay. Um, But what does he say? He says, help, I'm <laughs> up here, uh, can somebody shoot me down, I'm stuck in a tree. Right, so not a lot of indication. Right, then he falls down and, you you know, he doesn't do anything. He has no idea why he's there, He's not. he doesn't have guns, he walks around, he's confused, and then he pulls out a scoople. Yeah, so maybe I'm getting a little bit of a Serenity vibe. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're getting a little bit of a May vibe, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, this seems really universal. Everybody I've talked to yeah, me too. thinks this guy is the medic. This is the team medic. That explains why he's there. No need to figure out whether or not he's a killer because sure. he's clearly just the yeah, medic. Yeah, well, even the fucking characters right. just assume, ah, I don't know what that guy's up to. Ah, maybe he's the medic. And uh, later, I mean, the fact that he has a scalpel and the fact that he knows some biology stuff sure. or whatever, 
that might lead you to to indicate that, but I think that's more people projecting their right. Oh, this is going to be one of those movies where everybody has a thing. Exactly. If I could continue just making calls for how creative and original and uh, well written these characters are, we're not going to get enough of it in here, so you might as well. I uh, I want to talk specifically about Adrian Brody. Okay. Just as a casting choice, Adrian Brody being Royce being possibly one of the best casting decisions of 2010. Oh my God. So I think the idea when they cast him was, you know, you're making a, a movie that's a sequel to a classic. Sure. Predator. Yeah. And there's you're been, making a sequel to Schwarzenegger. Right. There's been a ton of Predator movies that all fall in that good old Rotten Tomatoes under 15% Three kind point of Three-point scale. I mean, you know, honestly, they're probably about 20-something percents. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they, mm-hmm. they have handfuls of fans. We did them on the show. But none of these were considered truly great the way that Predator was. And so when they made the sequel, sequel, not reboot, sequel, they wanted to kind of use that reboot feeling. They wanted to make it something separate to get that new sure. audience into it. But they also wanted to make it something original that would stand next to the classic right not on top of the right, classic for sure and so they were faced with this decision you know you cast another arnold schwarzenegger and everybody compares him to the original and of course everybody says what they say not as good as arnold sure. schwarzenegger he's not arnold schwarzenegger that's inevitable you cannot beat something it's been over 20 years right yeah. once some once a film has taken 20 years it's too classic for you to ever actually beat it the best you can do is emulate it really good but different. Yeah, because if you're a separate movie, there's a separate point of comparison. Yep. So before we talk about that casting call, I uh, I kind of feel like this plan succeeded. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I didn't hear a lot of I've never heard this is better slash worse than Predator. Nope. No one really said that. No. Everybody was having these unique conversations about sure. this movie specifically. Right. So genius plan. Worked and I, I feel like this is a big part of it. So they want to cast somebody who looks different than Arnold. We're going to do a completely different thing than Arnold. And so they pick a scrawnier guy, they pick a character-driven guy, they pick Adrian Brody. What Adrian apparently loves about this, uh, this role, I was reading this great, great interview where he's talking all about this, he's basically saying Arnold Schwarzenegger was the 80s idea of a soldier. He was the action hero. Sure. Adrian Brody, and while he didn't credit himself for defining this, I think he very well may, uh-huh. he is our modern soldier. Yeah. He is uh, the true you know, version of what a, a soldier looks right. like. Or at least looks like today. I love the fantasy view that in the 80s, everybody in the military looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Looked like Duke Nukem. I, yeah, I assume that's probably not the case. But whatever. Let's just, I have no evidence. So fine. That's okay. But uh, today, it's, it's 18-year-old kids. Mm-hmm. It's honestly kind of people who look like us. Sure. People who look like us that do, you know, slightly more physical labor. Right. Slightly you know, that, a lot more. That have muscles in their body. Yeah. Right. But they're not these giants, you know, they aren't built like fucking tanks. Sure. They are, they're thin guys that have a lot of battle experience that are, you know, smart on a battlefield. And that is who Adrian Brody's character is. Yeah. That's what he looks like. He looks like a, a muscular, but normal human being. Sure. You know, he's not the kind of guy who's going to plow down everybody in the jungle. And that's probably one of the smartest decisions this movie makes. Yeah. But I also feel like uh, having Topher Grace be, you know, both the comic relief and the foil yeah. is a great decision. Yeah. Because the whole time, again, your brain's doing that stupid thing where you go, this is the guy with the Gatling yeah. gun, and this is the guy, with he's the leader, and here's mm-hmm. the badass chick who can fend for herself, right. but blah 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 Three blah. red shirts, and that's it. Here's the Mexican who's in all those other great films. No right. one's thinking that. They right. should be. They're not. And you get to that character and you say, here is the comic relief. Right. And you root for him to live yeah. because that's what you do with the comic yep. relief is you Absolutely. hate to see the comic relief die. And then when he gets to the point where he turns, you wish you had just left him <laughs> behind in that fucking trap. Yeah, yeah you do. You, oh my you God. wish he had died every time they went back to save him and brought him with instead. I mean, what an incredible decision. You make it the very character that, uh, first of all, you don't suspect because right. he's the comic relief. And he's the medic. Yeah, so you feel stupid, too, because right. you thought he was right. the medic and the comic relief. And he's the fucking guy who you were rooting for to live. Right. And now you feel like a jerk. You sure. feel betrayed. You hate him even more. Right. Which is why it's so nice to just... that. That's one of the best payoffs in the film, when Royce shoves the scalpel up his jaw yeah, and right. says, but I'm fast, and then ties a bunch of grenades to him. Yes. Love it. 
You mean after he explodes in the spaceship, but doesn't right. explode in the spaceship? Yeah. That was a great moment too. I was just expecting that. Uh, that was one of those things where I think the filmmakers know what people are expecting. Sure. The spaceship blows up and I'm thinking uh, I'm actually buying it because yeah. that's just how this movie might end. Right. It's just going to explode a spaceship and that's going to be your main character. Yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. But what it does do, if not kill the main character, is give you the glorious feeling at the end of, hey, we won and we're totally fucked anyway. (laughs) Right. Right. You are still fucked. Yeah. It still got rid of the ship. It can get a little bit better at the ending, but Mm -hmm. you're still fucked. And I think one of the smartest things that Predators did is that instead of doing, we, we, we haven't done the Star Trek film, but that did it very well too. The new one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing a thing where they risk destroying the old canon of this is how the predator was in the first film they go well similar predators yeah but right. these are there's different blood feud they're bigger they have different weapons it's not the same predators sure. so they don't operate the same sure. so we're not trampling on your idea of the predator from the right. first film these predators have dogs they're bigger they're meaner they wear jaw bones that it's it's a beautiful device to avoid stepping on the toes of the other laws that have been created. Well, it also makes itself more important, right? right? Because it's their planet. Yeah. So suddenly all that other shit, that was just one-off people who flew their dinky ship to Earth. My bad. None of that shit matters. This is the real stuff right here. Mm -hmm. This is the planet. Uh, And Lawrence Fishburne. I don't know how we didn't talk about Lawrence Fishburne in this movie either, but uh, crazy. Yeah. Fucking crazy. And he's crazy. really good at being crazy. Are yeah, you talking about his character or the fact I, that he looks nothing like Morpheus? Uh, crazy. So crazy. You know, and I don't want to go without saying how creative the movie is effects-wise. Yeah. Or um, just in the moments that it's constructing for... Samurais? Uh, well, uh, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, how brutal, how well done those specific moments sure. really are. They you become know, iconic the first time you see them. The first It's not the kind time. of thing where... You look back on it and think, oh, the samurai moment, that was iconic. I remember in the theater, they're in a field of grass. Sure. The Yakuza turns around, and I'm immediately going, this is that moment. Yeah, the crowd knows it, too. It's those crowd-pleasing moments. It's uh, that Trejo trap that was right. so great. Or the the skull and the spine pull. Right. Right? Sure. The, um The timing and pacing of those kind of different moments or the reveals, they're on the planet. You know, the, you, the camera sees the skull. They're on the planet. They get the smaller creatures. They go to that kind of gross, bloody pit thing mm-hmm. where one of them is tied up, and you know they see the uh, the empty cages. Those things are all laid out uh, instead of the random order. I'm trying to recall them yeah. in, in my head. <laughs> they're uh, they're laid out in this just incredible order to reveal one thing after another sure. to make it more viable, and then just to make. I mean, you have that the skull and spine pole, and you think when that happens, that will be the most badass thing. But that scene is followed immediately by the sword fight. Right. Immediately. You have everybody in the theater screaming and applauding, and then the sword fight, and you know by the first frame. Mm Mm-hmm. This is gonna be this is gonna be an artsy fucking great right. you know one off scene. And if you're if you're more an action buff, then you get the fucking Royce with the axe running through the fire to right. you know call back to the first film right just that whole fucking scene is one of the most triumphantly violent scenes in the movie well and so you have the predator decapitation sure. where he just slices the head clean off and you know they cut to the wide shot and it lets out the the other predator lets out this kind of huge growl right which is uh i mean it's so easy for that shot to feel corny i've never sure. really seen the i'm a badass shot feel triumphant the way it does here right where you're actually a little bit scared right like not super scared that's but the point where you go this is probably over in the <laughs> yeah. wrong way yeah they're fucked yeah but then you do get a final shot of royce beating the fucking predator to death <laughs> before the next slice it's their uh it's their way of one-upping that decapitation sure. scene what would have been one of the most badass scenes i guess still is one of sure. the most badass scenes well so is every third scene in the film yeah right well, seeing that neck slice and then it falls back and you're just waiting for the blood to just, just squirt out a tiny bit. Looks like you've got some green on you. 
So everybody knows the website. The website is doublefeatureshow.com. You yep. can look up, oh, I don't know, a history of all of the Killapaloozas we've done by clicking on that Killapalooza button. Holy shit. That's going to become important in about five seconds. Uh-huh. Uh, the other thing is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I'd love for people to email us their initial reactions to Predators. Uh-huh. Or the, um, their thoughts on this pair, if you actually went ahead and watched them. Right. If they feel like this pair... If 12 Angry Men, first of all, legitimized the writing in Predators a little bit more, because I think it makes it a little better. But also... Um, if they got it. Yeah, if they got it. If it wasn't just Tank Girl and Schindler's List, yeah. but instead if this kind of made a little sense to you. It's simultaneously one of our most embarrassing, but also best I double feature agree. pairings. Yeah. Does both at once. Uh, next time on the show, we have a Killapalooza. We're going to do some uh, some Killapalooza number 14. So this is this is probably one of our weirdest Killapaloozas, and we probably say that every time. Yeah. But we've done the director. This is Don Coscarelli, who oh, yeah, yeah. is Bubba Hotep. Yeah. Well, and he's not Bubba Hotep. He no, made Bubba he Hotep. Made Bubba Hotep. Important but, distinction. Very important distinction. But he sticks through all four of the Phantasm films. Ah, another short one, too, so people have no excuse not to watch terrible movies. But we're going to cover all four Phantasm films, the exploits of the Thin Man and the Spiky Bleedy Balls. And we don't know. They might be great movies. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.